from the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. We gather today as disciples walking on the path following Jesus. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church, where we are inspiring disciples and engaging the world. Whether you're a visitor or regular member, or if you're worshiping with us online, we're so glad to be together with you this morning. Please take a moment and sign the friendship books that are in your rows and pass those down. That's an excellent way to get to know the names of the people you're sitting with and hope you'll greet one another at some point this morning. And as always, if you're interested in joining our congregation, please see one of the ministers after worship. One quick announcement for you today. We wanted to share that Pastor Liz from Cuba uh, has enjoyed a wonderful wonderful week in, in Fort Worth. It kept her very busy, and uh, we're so grateful for Liz and our Cuba partnership, and uh, pleased that she's with us this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite Terrence Butler forward from Academy 4 to share a minute for mission. Welcome, Terrence. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. My name is Terrence Butler, and I'm the Vice President of Development for Academy 4. I've been uh, at the earlier service, and I've just uh, felt so welcome here today, so I want to thank you for that. Um, if you are a current mentor, will you please raise your hand or stand up? I see that you have your shirts on, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, for partnering with us. Yes. We have about 50 to go, so please see Sydney and I in the foyer after the service. Let me tell you a little bit about Academy 4. We started about 12 years ago. We're a mentoring program in fourth grade elementary schools, Title I elementary schools, and that designation just means that that's where the most need is, uh, free and reduced lunch. And what we do is we come in monthly, once a month, nine times for 90 minutes, and we mentor that child in leadership. And we have our own uh, curriculum that's evidence-based, and it's one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And what that really does for that child is it allows them to grow in areas of socialization. Uh, they come to school more. We see them go to the office less. And then that really becomes the gas in that academic car to get those children where they need to be. Uh, I want to close with a story. We had a, a mentor, and his name is Fred, and Fred um, uh, came down with cancer, and he said, hey, I have scheduled all of my cancer treatment around my mentoring schedule, and we we're like, no, you don't need to do that. We'll get you a substitute mentor, and he said, well, I really don't know what my mentee would do without me, and what Fred was really saying is, he doesn't know what he would do without his mentor, mentee. And what that means to me is that it becomes this manifestation of relationship building every time that mentor and that mentee takes place. It goes both ways. So thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to share. And please see us in the foyer after the service. God bless you. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. O oh God, open us to the powerful winds of your spirit. Open our eyes to the wonders of your creation. Open our nostrils to the smells of life. Open our ears to the words of justice and truth. Open our mouths to the taste of freedom and love. Open our arms to the touch of our sisters and brothers.
scripture says in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But it says, the promise is, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In that hope, then, let us pray together. Most gracious God, giver of life, who loves and forgives us, though unworthy, we confess that we are burdened by excess baggage as we travel the roads you send us down. We are caught up too soon in the trappings of religion. We seek too quickly to be a successful organization rather than a church on a mission. Too often we wish to be served rather than to serve. For all this, forgive us and free us to walk the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ the way. Hear now our personal prayers of confession. They are a new creation. The past is finished and gone and everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 16b through 21. Listen for God's word to you this day. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear." For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. At this time, I invite all of our children forward to join me up here on the floor. And if you have your offering, you can bring it for our joyful noise pail at this time.
Good morning, friends. It is so good to see you this morning and to worship together today. This last week, we gathered here at the church for Vacation Bible School. And many of you have on our t-shirts and you might see in the congregation um, these light blue t-shirts. And those are several of our volunteers that were with us all week as we had Compassion Camp this week as we were talking about sharing loving kindness with the world so that we can change the world through loving kindness. We talked about different stories in our Bible of compassion. We heard about Miriam's compassion. We heard about Elijah's compassion for himself. We heard about the disciples spreading compassion to their neighbors so that we can have compassion for ourselves, for our neighbors, and ultimately spread that around the world. And so we had a compassion chant that we said every day, multiple times a day, and that has helped me remember everything that we have been learning this week. So can we say our compassion chant together so that way uh, we can teach the congregation that compassion chant? Here we go. I see your hurt. I feel your hurt. I help ease your hurt. Very good. One more time. I see your hurt, I feel your hurt, I help ease your hurt. And so, VBS is over, Compassion Camp is over. However, that does not mean we stop sharing compassion with those around us. We've been practicing all week sharing compassion, and it's our job to go out into the world and continue to sharing compassion to our neighbors. So we can remember our compassion chant. We can also remember the song that we sang with Miss Laura, who's going to help us lead the song um, and also help us share it with the, the rest of the congregation. We're all going to sing it together. So we're going to learn it. My turn, your turn. Okay. Are your listening ears on, everybody? Make sure your listening ears are on. My turn first. May I be happy. Healthy. May I be safe? May I be at peace? And then we take those words and instead of singing I, we change it to you. So we sing, May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May you be at peace. And there are some amens. Amen. Amen. Y'all sound fantastic. This song uh, was part of our curriculum. It's by an awesome songwriter, Amanda Meisenheimer. So let's have the kids stand up and share with you all. We'll sing each verse twice. So may I be happy and may I be healthy two times. Join us the second time each time, okay? All right. Are we ready, friends? our friends. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May you be at peace. One more time. May you be happy.
friends. Thank you so much. All right, friends. Thank you for helping to teach the congregation things that we have learned this week. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll go back and sit with our families. You can put your prayer hands on, and you can repeat after me. Loving God, we give you thanks for your compassion, for your loving kindness, and all the ways we spread it around to our neighbors. We love you, Lord. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. All right, friends, you can go back and sit with your families. Uh, that was pretty nice. Let's do the call and repeat for the whole sermon. You ready? Today's sermon is going to take twice as long as usual. Oh, great song, though, isn't it? I love that the kids have been singing that all week. Um, what a great thing to uh, help ground them in compassion. Um, I remember a lot of things from VBS as a child, but it's usually one or two details from VBS that last, and I think that song will last, and so thanks be to God for that. Very grateful. Um, one more repeat. Hojo, Amojo, Mina, Hazi, Hazi, Ma. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. Remember, this is our mnemonic to remember. Uh, Hojo, Hosea, Joel, Am, um, we're on Amos today. Hojo, Amojo, Mina, Hazi, Hazi, Ma. We're on Amos. Uh, Amos was a successful sheep breeder. He was a uh, fig tree farmer, and he lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. He was a good old southern boy. His home was in Tekoa, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. This was right around the Dead Sea and along the Mediterranean coast. Uh, this means that Amos was living a comfortable life with his waterfront property. Uh, everything had fallen into place for Amos. Uh, everything was going well for Amos, but then God called, right? Then God called and told him things weren't going so well up north, and God wanted to use him, Amos, to help. And this forever changed Amos' life and the life of God's people. Begs the question, though, if you think about it with Amos, it begs the question, uh, why me? Why him? Why Amos? Uh, and in this book, at one point, Amos says this, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. Yet the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And so we went, not knowing why God picked him, not knowing exactly what it was going to entail, but he went. Uh, today, friends, if God can use Amos, uh, perhaps God can use even us. Join me in prayer, and then I'll read his prophecy. Almighty and amazing God, Enlighten our minds, kindle our hearts, illumine us with your presence, that we may hear your word on this day, your words of comfort and your words of challenge, as we read your word through the lens of your Son, our Savior. We love you, Lord. Amen. 
Uh, Amos chapter 5. Alas, for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, So I said Amos was living in the southern kingdom of Judah. He was a southern boy and God sent him up to the north, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, North, south, Israel, Judah, they're all still God's people, but Amos from Judah going up north to Israel, it's kind of like visiting your second cousin thrice removed. There's still a family connection, but everything seems a little odd and strange to you about it. But Amos agreed nonetheless, and Amos traveled up north, And I think he was a little surprised at what he found. Now, Amos had some money, don't hear me wrong. He was very well off with his waterfront property there. Amos was well off in that respect uh, because he was a farmer and he made a good living and he was a hard worker and he knew what a day's work looked like. But when he got up there, Amos found a lot of other people with a lot more money than even he had, Uh, yet they didn't have the same work ethic, nor morals, nor principles, nor prudence, it seemed. Uh, They didn't really seem to have the same as him of anything at all. Uh, They didn't really seem to have any moral compass either, and many of them were taking full advantage of some of the quote-unquote unclaimed resources around them, and they were, according to their standards, doing very well at this. Uh, Chapter 6, it says, those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches, who sing idle songs, improvise on instruments, who drink wine from bowls, they anoint themselves with the finest oils. I think it was uh, Randolph and Mortimer Duke in the movie Trading Places who said, you know, having money just makes you want more money. I'm not sure if they studied Old Testament economics to come up with that line, but they kind of hit this one right on the head. They caught the essence pretty well. Israel had a growing upper class that was ostentatious to say the least, with their overconsumption, with their debauchery, with their immorality. In other words, they kept very busy putting the total into their depravity time and time again. Yeah, they were indulging in opulence and they were completely indifferent to the plight of the poor. It was even worse than you might imagine. Uh, It says in there that the rich would cheat people in the marketplace on purpose. They would go to the marketplace and they would cheat the people that they were buying goods from. It says they would practice deceit with false balances in chapter 8. But then they would dare the people that they were cheating to say anything about it. They would dare them to call them on it because they were also in control of the police and the courts at that point. It says uh, they hate the one who reproves in the gate. They abhor the one who speaks the truth. They who afflict the righteous, they who take a bribe, they who push aside the needy at the gate. You know how all words have a root that comes from somewhere or all phrases, colloquialisms? I think the phrases trampled upon and pushed around come from this. 
They trampled the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and pushed the afflicted out of the way. This is a literal speaking. The rich kept getting richer, while the poor kept getting sold into slavery. Uh, Chapter 2 reads, They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Yeah, they believe that every day belonged to them. They believe that every day was their day. They believed that their day would never end. But God had something to say about that, right? God had a word for them. And so God sent Amos, the southerner, up north to Israel to say, "Uh, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Great way to start, right? You who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, the revelry of the lounger shall pass away. Indeed, Your day shall end, for the day of the Lord is approaching. Their day and the day of the Lord seem to be very different days, right? Uh, The shocking part of the first half of our text today for me uh, is the fact that the very people God is telling this to, uh, the very people doing all this, those same people think that God is talking to someone else. Uh, They don't get that the word is coming to them. Uh, Text says they were wanting the day of the Lord to come. They were anticipating it with eagerness, it says. Uh, Maybe they were just really curious what it was going to be like, or maybe they just thought, well, we have such a great life. Maybe God wants to come down and join in on our fun. We don't know exactly. We don't know why they thought this. We just know that they thought this and that they were looking forward to that day. And God says to them at the beginning of our text today, Alas, for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It's darkness, not light. It's the opposite of what you're currently living. And God continues on in our passage in a very uh, Alanis Morissette kind of way, in my opinion. Uh, For these opulent, exploitive Israelites to desire the day of the Lord, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Uh, It would be as if someone fled from a lion, it says in our text. They fled from a lion and they were met by a bear. So you start running away from a lion and as you're running away, you run into a bear. It's like rain on your wedding day. It's like a free ride when you've already paid, right? Isn't it ironic, don't you think? Text continues, it says, it would be as if someone went into the house and they rested their hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. They went into their house, they left the world, they went into comfort and security and shelter, and when they finally let their guard down, they were bit by a snake in their own home. Like the good advice that you just didn't take. Isn't it ironic, don't you think? The irony here, of course, that God gets and that Amos is describing for these rich, overindulgent, bowl o' wine drinking Israelites. Uh, the irony here is that they think the day of the Lord is for them. Uh, they think the day of the Lord is going to be a great day. They think the day of the Lord is what they're living, and they think the day of the Lord is coming to justify. Justify them, justify their lifestyle, justify their corruption, their abuse, and their exploitation of the poor. They think the day of the Lord is coming to justify, but the day of the Lord is really coming to bring justice. Justice for the oppressed. Justice for the subjugated. Justice for the enslaved. The day of the Lord brings justice. It is not to justify those things which shall not be. Isn't that ironic? Sometimes I wonder if I'm missing the irony. Mass marketed, overconsumption, global warming, growing inequality in our world. 
Sometimes I worry that I miss the irony. Did you know that as of today, there are over 200,000 child soldiers? 200,000 child soldiers today. Did you know that as of today, there are 29 million modern day slaves? 29 million people living as slaves today. Things cannot continue how they are. Things will not continue as they are. Amos goes on to describe why God doesn't like their festivals, their gatherings, their worship, their assemblies. Amos goes on to describe why, because they have no heart in them, he says. There's no heart. They're empty words. It's meaningless activity, God says. Until you start addressing some of these things, why are you going to sing songs about it? God doesn't accept those things. God doesn't accept the things that they've been doing. And so God says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now, that one verse you might have heard before, that one verse you might have had popped out, but are you surprised by the context? Justice can be an awkward term, can it? I think justice is one of those vague terms that people throw around willy-nilly. I feel like comic books and Hollywood and TV have kind of stolen the term from us, if I'm honest with you. Uh, justice has become this sort of a, a revenge fantasy. It becomes a us versus them duality there. It, it rewards some and it punishes others. That's what we think of when we think of justice, right? And it's doled out more often than not with someone with like laser vision or like a cool utility belt or someone with superpowers, right? Yeah, that's what we think of. Uh, they've made 15 Justice League movies in the last decade, 15 of them. Uh, justice is becoming trendy again, but I'm not sure if that's helpful for our understanding of what true justice really is. That's not any of what God is referencing here. True justice is different than that. True justice is not about revenge. True justice is not about punishment at all. True justice gives people not what they deserve, um, but what they need. True justice gives people what they need. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And so what will the day of the Lord look like with this dispensing of that needed justice that we have. We have illustrations and illusions all throughout the minor prophets. We're going to have people keep talking about it all the time, but it's, it's even bigger than that. It's even beyond just the minor prophets. We have allusions to that day. Uh, in this one, we have doom and gloom because there are some things on that day that are going to be doomed and gloomed. There are some things that cannot continue when the day of the Lord arrives. And so God is naming that. But on a total opposite note, in 1 John that Pastor Ashley read for us earlier today, we get another understanding of that day. Counter to the destruction that we read about in Amos, God destroying things that need to be destroyed on the day of the Lord, uh, 1 John talks about what's going to be perfected on that day, what will be brought to completion on that day. And it says, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on that day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. Different angles, same day. Different perspectives, same event. That same day, the day of gloom, the day of darkness, the day in which all things will be set right is also the same day that love will be shown to be perfected, that all will abide with God and that all can live with boldness because God is in our midst in that new way. That day in which justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, there will be some things that are destroyed because they need to be. 
The darkness will be vanquished. The darkness will be gone. Greed will be gone. Exploitation will be gone. Abuse will be gone on that day. But there are other things that will be brought to completion on that same day, like peace and community and shalom and love. You see, true justice gives us not what we deserve, but what we need. And that kind of true justice has nothing to do with Hollywood. It has nothing to do with revenge or settling the score. That kind of justice is a very different kind of justice altogether. That kind of justice can only come from a place of love. True justice gives us not what we deserve, but what we need. Uh, Karl Barth liked to talk about this. Karl Barth once explained you cannot talk about God's justice apart from God's love. He called this a dialectical pair He said, you cannot talk about one without the other. He said, in order to define one, you need the other. To leave the other out is an incomplete definition of what it is. So he said, we always need to think of this in terms of God's loving justice or God's just love. To say anything other than that is to make an incomplete theological statement, he said. True justice gives us not what we deserve, but what we need. Cornell West, who's now running for president, apparently, famously said and has this on his campaign website, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. True justice gives us not what we deserve, but what we need. The day of the Lord to truly be the Lord's day, justice must roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And it must flow freely. It must flow fully. It must flow from that pool of perfected love, cleansing us, renewing us, restoring us, refreshing and replenishing this entire world. That's the day of the Lord. That's the day that's coming. Our choice is whether we live into it or not. Our choice is whether we choose to participate in the things that will be perfected or do we allow the things that will be destroyed. Amos was a successful sheep breeder and fig tree farmer. He lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. His home was in Tekoa. This was just about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. It was right around the Dead Sea. He lived on the Mediterranean coast. Amos was living a comfortable life with his waterfront property. Everything had fallen in place for Amos. Everything was going well for Amos. But then God called. God called and told him things are not going so well up north. And God wanted to use him, use Amos, to help. And this forever changed his life. It forever changed Amos' life as well as the life of God's people. Begs the question, though. I wonder what Amos did when he got back home. You'll notice another pattern in a lot of the minor prophets. They, They really only have one sermon, and they deliver it once, and then they're done. I wonder what Amos did when he got back home. Biblical scholars say his ministry up north, his prophetic ministry in Israel probably lasted only a very short while, and then he probably would have gone back to Tacoma, gone back to his home. So I wonder what Amos did when he got back home. What do you do when you hear a message like that? What do you do when your eyes are open and you're charged with carrying the message. It wasn't specifically addressed to him. Uh, He wasn't one of the cows of Bashan. He wasn't being sold into slavery either. But nonetheless, it would have to affect him, right? When you've seen the things you've seen and you've said the things you've said, it has to affect you, right? It has to have some sort of an impact on your life in some way. It wasn't specifically addressing him but it kind of was, right? I wonder what Amos did when he got back home. 
Did he start teaching his neighbors about dialectical pairs? Loving justice, just love? Did he work more on what the world needed, what would become perfected? Did he work more against the things that were going to be destroyed? Did he work more against the things that uh, needed to be avoided in this world? I wonder what Amos did when he got back home. I wonder what I'll do when I get back home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, amen. Our prayers of the people this day, Pastor Liz will join me in Spanish and I in English. So let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Dios de paz, venimos ante ti dando gracias por el regalo de este día y por la luz y la promesa que ofreces al mundo. Oramos por la paz para este planeta tan lleno de problemas. God of peace, we come before you giving thanks for the gift of this great day and for the light and promise you offer to the world. We pray for peace for this planet that's so filled with problems. 
en donde haya personas que se miren unas a otras con rencor y odio en sus corazones, enséñanos maneras de reconciliar nuestras diferencias. En donde haya familias separadas por el enojo y las frustraciones, danos el conocimiento del amor que sobrepasa la desilusión y la rebelión. Where people look at one another with bitterness and hate in their hearts, teach us, O oh God, ways to reconcile our differences. Where families are separated by anger and frustration, give us your love that overcomes disillusion and rebellion. En donde haya naciones separadas por luchas internas o amargura en contra de sus vecinos, enséñanos nuevas maneras de vivir en paz y armonía. Concédeles tu paz que sobrepasa todo entendimiento humano. Where nations fight internally or with one another, teach us to live in peace and harmony. Where individuals are overcome with problems, give them your peace that surpasses our human understanding. En donde haya señales y semillas de paz, por, mis pequeñas, por más pequeñas que estas sean, Ayúdanos a celebrar su presencia, a estimular su desarrollo y brindarles cuidado, y a regocijarnos en su crecimiento. En el nombre de Cristo, el Príncipe de Paz, oramos. Where there are signs and seeds of peace, tiny though they may be, help us to celebrate their presence, to nurture them with vigilance, and rejoice in their growth. It's in the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace, that we all pray together as you teach us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because we need not fear tomorrow, we offer ourselves today, time and our possessions, to the work of God through the church. Do not be afraid for your well-being. Give generously in the name of the one who gave everything for us. Jesus, he will embrace me. 
Let us pray. Holy God, who gives life, nourishment, and strength to all creation, we thank you. Bless these gifts that all may be nurtured in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers, sisters, saints, as we go out of this place on this day, I send you with the same reminder that you always get. Uh, we don't go out alone, but we go out together as the body of Christ into this world. And as we go out, uh, remember what true justice is. True justice has nothing to do with retribution. True justice has nothing to do with settling the score. True justice is what we need. It's what we hope for. It's what we long for. It's what we pray for. Uh, true justice is loving justice. May it be so. Go with the grace and the peace of the God who created you, the God who redeems you, and the God who sustains you now and forevermore. Amen.